Hi, I'm Eleanor Silverberg, and I'm uh, facilitating this workshop this morning based on my expertise as a grief specialist and caregiving specialist and dementia specialist, the combination of all of them. I also draw from my personal experience as well with, with grief. Uh, I've been intrigued with grief since I was a student, and I always, you know, I always looked for ways of doing research and papers on, on grief, and, and very often they involve grief in caregiving, not just dealing with death, and very much so I dealt with non-death losses. I, also, um, you know, wondered why this intrigue in grief. And it really is rooted in my childhood upbringing, uh, being a child of Holocaust survivors. My parents survived being uh, prisoners of war and were left with hardly any family, maybe one or two family members. And uh, so I know grief. I'm not a stranger to grief right from the get-go, from my childhood. So, um, you know, I, I hope that from the content of this presentation that I can empower you to self-monitor with self-awareness as I share the, um, the model that I have developed to address grief of all kinds. Um, and so you can move forward coping with strength and resiliency. So let's start the conversation on, on uh, navigating loss with comparing social isolation with social connection. And the beauty is that I want you to bear in mind is that it's your choice, not somebody outside of yourself, but it is your choice of how you move forward. Do you isolate yourself or do you connect? Isolation defined is withdrawing, detaching, going into seclusion, hiding. And you may be inclined to do that naturally. It may be an easy way because you might feel hopeless, sad, lack of energy, lack of motivation to do anything. And that is an easy way out by, uh, by just going into isolation and withdrawing from society. This is Psychology 101, um, showing you uh, uh, Abram, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the hierarchy starts with food and shelter, and then feeling safe, which when you experience a loss, and it could be the loss of a spouse of, of 50 years, and you, you, your safety goes, you, it's, like, it's like losing your right arm, actually. So it, th there is validation for having these feelings of not feeling safe. The third um, on the hierarchy is belonging and feelings of love. If, if you, let's say, uh, are dealing with a job loss, and or you might have been, de are dealing with a layoff, for instance, you may have a, a sense of lack of belonging because you are no longer a part of an organization and you're dealing with 
um, a, a, a loss of feeling, where do I belong? I don't have a routine anymore. So belonging is, is a human need, and that's what is on this hierarchy. What are the needs for self-fulfillment? So food, shelter, safety, and a sense of belonging. So when you withdraw and you go into isolation, you may have a tendency to have feelings of loneliness. Now you could be alone. There's a difference between being alone and feelings of loneliness because it's the feelings of loneliness that really impact. And it is actually prevalent. And many people do not realize that it impacts on well-being. So, you know, there's a lack of connection, lack of belonging, but it's painful. It's not only emotional pain, painful, but it can also affect you physically, and it can be a health risk. In um, research that was done, that was um, supported by the National Institute on Aging, um, Dr. Steve Cole, the lead researcher, says, loneliness acts as a fertilizer for other diseases. The biology of loneliness can accelerate the buildup of plaque in arteries, help cancer cells grow and spread, and promote inflammation in the brain, leading to Alzheimer's disease. Loneliness promotes several different types of wear and tear on the body. People who feel lonely may also have weakened immune cells that have trouble fighting off viruses, which makes them more vulnerable to some infectious diseases. So you can really get a sense of the impact, the health impact of loneliness that many may not be aware of, that you may not be aware of. The beauty is, and again, you have choice. You can self-monitor yourself with self-awareness and see that are you lonely because you're building walls? instead of bridges. In other words, are you the one that's making, that's making you feel this loneliness? Do you, can you do something to help you not feel lonely, to compact, combat the loneliness? It, it comes from within you. So the, again, the beauty is that it is empowering that you have control to make change if you are feeling lonely. Now, connection, remember we were talking about isolation versus connection. I just spoke to you about isolation, but in making connection defined, it's joining together, linking, uniting, and to be associated with. So how can you connect to combat loneliness? So you can reach out. You can reach out and join a group, a special interest group. If you're into sports, you may want to go and maybe go to the community center and play badminton. And you, you join in. I personally, I play pickleball. Uh, and I really enjoy it. And, and it, when you go regularly, you make social connections. And, and being with people, making the connection with people is the important thing. Maybe you go to your church or your synagogue or your temple and join into the activities there and become an active participant. This, this can help you to connect. Now, 
connecting is not something you do once a month and then you say, and then go back into isolation. That's not going to be as assisting you as much as you doing it every day, frequently connecting. And it can be for a short period of time. You may want to call up a friend and reach out that way. Uh, you know, you may want to go out for lunch. You may even want to go to your uh, uh, neighborhood coffee shop and choose a cho coffee shop that you go to regularly because there you'll get familiar with the staff there. And there's a connection. Anywhere you can make a connection with people on a regular basis. So it's also not making the connection, but also the quantity of time that you spend making connections as well that is important. And sometimes, yes, you do have to push out of the lack of motivation, the hopelessness, the feeling of sadness that comes with grieving a loss. But that pushing and going out of your comfort zone to connect, you can see by what I told you about even just loneliness, how it can assist you. Now accepting help is, is a strength as well, that if a family member offers, let's say if you are a caregiver for someone with dementia and your daughter offers to help you, say yes and say it with a smile. In other words, be open to accepting help because that's another way of staying connected. And also how you treat yourself. When you're vulnerable, and you are vulnerable when you're grieving because, you know, you could be in a low mood. If you're feeling lack of motivation, you could be vulnerable. And it could be a time when you could be very hard on yourself. So by giving yourself compassionate self-care is also a way to be connected, connected to yourself, another way to assist. So you can self-monitor with self-awareness. And a method that I developed to, um, to uh, help is the 3A coping framework of acknowledge, assess, assist to help you stay connected.